Please join me in Jeremiah chapter 33, which is a continuation of events during the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem in 588 BC, when Jeremiah was confined to the prison of the palace there. We remember in chapter 32 that he was supposed to go ahead and purchase property as a demonstration that this will have value in the future of Israel, that a righteous remnant is going to return and uh, the country is going to grow back to some sense of normalcy and uh, properties will be bought and sold and worked again. Now we jump forward just maybe a few days, a few weeks, certainly not many months, uh, while the siege is still going on and Jeremiah is still confined and God still wants to pass messages on through him. So Jeremiah 33, 1. The word of he who is came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the guard. Thus says he who is who made the earth, he who is who formed it to establish it, he who is is his name. Now that's a tie-in to the very foundational books of the Old Testament. Book of Genesis with the creation account, book of Exodus where we first hear the divine name being applied uh, to mean he who is. Verse 3, call to me and I will answer you. See, call on me as creator. Call on me as the one who was, is, and will always be. So call to me and I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. For thus says he who is the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah that were torn down to make a defense against the siege mounds and against the sword. Now, you need to think about the logistics of a siege. You've got the Babylonians out there that have built up siege ramps so that they could bring their siege engines up against the wall so they could use their battering rams against it. And uh, they're casting things in, maybe great stones by catapult up and over the wall into the city itself. Uh, maybe they're trying to catch things on fire. Uh, and on the inside of the city, the defenders are doing everything they can to stave off this attack of their city. So they're taking bits and pieces of destroyed buildings and they're reinforcing walls they're reinforcing gates. They're trying to make the perimeter portions of the city stronger against this siege. So they're basically cannibalizing the city of Jerusalem. They're dismantling beautiful buildings and some of the best things that Solomon put in place for his own royal complex and turning it into uh, support beams and reinforced walls behind walls that are being battered. So this is what God has to say about that situation. Verse 5, They are coming in to fight against the Chaldeans and to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I shall strike down in my wrath and my anger, for I have hidden my face from this city because of all their evil. So the defenders are trying to get ready to fight against the Chaldeans, but they're losing people along the way. And what do you do with all those dead bodies? You store them up. You stockpile them in abandoned houses and in uh, public buildings that are not being used right now. And so God says, that's all happening because I'm done. My judgment is falling because my patience has reached its end. I've hidden my face from this city, meaning I am not listening to any of the cries for relief and salvation. 
that that might remind you of Ezekiel's time on his side where he had the great big metal plate between himself and the diorama of the city of Jerusalem under siege uh, to represent how God was not going to listen to prayers during the siege. So here's God saying that I've hidden my face from this city because of all their evil. Verse 6, Behold, I will bring it to health and healing, and I will heal them and reveal to them abundance of prosperity and security. So now we're back to the hints, the promises of future hope and future redemption. Uh, He's striking them now, but he's going to build them up later. Verse 7, I will restore the fortunes of Judah, the fortunes of Israel, and rebuild them as they were at first. So bringing them back to a high point again. That's God's promise after the time of of, uh, Zerubbabel and uh, Ezra and Nehemiah have rebuilt the city and the city's being repopulated. Things will start looking up again. Verse 8, I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me, and I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. Now, I believe verse number 8 is a hint at the coming of the Messiah, who will die at Jerusalem for the sins of the world and redeem all those who call upon his name out of their sin and their guilt. Verse number 9, this city shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and a glory before all the nations of earth who shall hear of all the good that I do for them. They shall fear and tremble because of all the good and all the prosperity I provide for it. So right now, everybody's fearing and trembling because of the judgment. And the name of Jerusalem and the name of Judah is a name of shame and sorrow and degradation. But God says, I'm going to reverse that. I'm going to turn it around. And he's going to turn it around, not just simply through the returns under people like uh, Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah, but also, ultimately, through the ministry of Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Verse 10, thus says he who is, In this place of which you say, it's a waste without man or beast in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man or inhabitant or beast, there shall be heard again the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thank offerings to the house of he who is. And then we have a quote of one of the favorite choruses of the history of Israel. Give thanks unto he who is of the hosts, for he who is is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So there's going to be a time when that song will be sung again, and there will be parties for weddings, and parties for engagements, and the births of children, And just all of the different high holy days, everybody will be happy again. Even though right now, it looks like everything is lost. And everybody's crying because of of the desolation that's coming. God says, I will restore the fortunes of the land as at first, says he who is. Verse 12, thus says he who is of the hosts. In this place that is waste, without man or beast, and in all the cities, there shall again be habitations of shepherds resting their flocks. So there will be a return to the normal life, including the pastoral scene of shepherds grazing their sheep peacefully. Verse 13, in the cities of the hill country, the central ridge line of Israel and Judah uh, was the high point of uh, the this ridge line where there were cities like Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Hebron and uh, to the north 
uh, places like, uh, 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 I'm trying to think here, Gibby of Saul uh, and uh, the cities of Bethel and all the way up to the valley of uh, Megiddo, the valley of Jezreel. This central ridgeline is referred to as the hill country. And then you've got a lower elevation mixture of flat land coming up from the Mediterranean, but hills coming down from the hill country. This is called the Shafila. It's the transition point between uh, coastal plain and central highland. So in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the Shafila, in the cities of the Negeb, the southern Judah, uh, northern Sinai uh, wilderness. In the land of Benjamin, that's the region immediately north of Jerusalem. The places about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah, the flock shall again pass under the hands of the one who counts them, says he who is. So all over the land, there will be a return to the peaceful life that includes taking care of sheep. Verse 14, Behold, the days are coming, declares he who is, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute judgment justice and righteousness in the land. Uh, now, this branch, uh, a couple of different words uh, get used. Uh, this word that's used here uh, is not as interesting as the other one, I don't believe. Uh, the other word for branch is where we get the word for Nazareth from. And so Jesus grows up in the town of Branches, up in Galilee. Uh, and he becomes the branch of the prophecies. Uh, this word here also has the same idea as the Netzer. Uh, it's the idea when you cut off a tree, the root's still alive, and so it shoots up little sprigs that can eventually become the tree all over again. So what's happening right now is that God is cutting down the tree of Judah. He's cutting down the kingdom of David. But there's going to be a branch, a sprig that comes up later, the Messiah. And he will bring justice and righteousness back to the land. Verse 16, in those days, Judah will be safe. Jerusalem will dwell securely. See, that's in high contrast to what's happening at the moment that Jeremiah is passing on this message because the city of Jerusalem and the country of Judah are not being saved and they are facing destruction and judgment. But in the days of the branch, in the days of the Messiah, they will dwell securely and be saved. Verse 16 finishes with, and this is the name by which it will be called. That is this new place, this new country, this new city. He who is righteousness, or he who is our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. It's Yahweh Sidnik Q. Uh, it's the idea that God is the one that provides our righteousness. And of course, those of us who have embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ, we know that Jesus is our righteousness. He's the one that provided us salvation. So this is a great messianic passage. Verse 17, for thus says he who is, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, meaning the Davidic line is not going to come to an ultimate end. Uh, right now, Zedekiah is about to be taken off into Babylonian exile. Uh, before him, his brother, Jehoiakim, also went off into Babylonian exile. The kingdom of that particular line from David is coming to an end. But 
the line itself will continue to exist forever. Because Jesus is from an alternate line of David. Uh, these kings that are going into exile uh, all come through Solomon. Jesus comes through Solomon's little brother, Nathan. And so the promise that God made to David, you will always have somebody of your line ready to reign. That's going to be kept through Jesus. So the Davidic line is not being wiped out. That's the promise. Verse 18, the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. Now we need to fine tune the wording here. The promise is not that burnt offerings, grain offerings, and sacrifices will continue forever, because we know that's not true. They end. What's promised is the Levitical line will never come to an end. There will always be people in existence from the Kohim, the priestly tribe, uh, and the Levitical tribe uh, from Lewi, the Lewim, the Levites. And we know that's true. No one has ever been able to wipe out either the Davidic dynasty line or the Levitical line. Verse number 19, the word of he who is came to Jeremiah. Thus says he who is, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, that is, if you can end time, so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David my servant may be broken so that he will not have a son to reign on his throne, and my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers. So it's always going to be day-night cycle. So too, there will always be somebody from David's line and from the Levitical line. Verse 22, As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, and the sands of the sea cannot be numbered or measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David my servant, and the Levitical priests who minister to me. Very similar language to promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that their descendants would be as numberless as the scars in the sky and the sand on the beach. Verse 23, the word of he who is came to Jeremiah. Have you not observed that these people are saying, he who is has rejected the two clans that he chose? Now, that helps explain why God's passing this information through Jeremiah. Because they're going around, these doomsayers, Jeremiah has been predicting the doom, but these doomsayers are not even taking consideration God's promises anymore. They're saying, David's line's about to be wiped out. All of them are going to die. The Levitical priest line, the Levitical service line, all of them are going to be killed by the Babylonians. There'll be nobody left. God's not going to keep his promises. So he who is has rejected the two clans that he chose. Thus, they've despised my people so that they are no longer a nation in their sight. Thus says he who is, if I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I'll reject the offspring of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will restore their fortunes, and I will have mercy on them. So God's response is, no, David's line is not going to be wiped out by the Babylonians or anyone else. Not uh, the people in the time of Esther, uh, where that evil Haman tries to wipe out Jewish people, nor even the Nazis of modern uh, history who tried to wipe out uh, the different lines of the Jewish people. Nobody's going to wipe out the Davidic line. Nobody's going to be able to wipe out the Levitical line because God said they will remain into eternity. There will always be somebody from those lines around. And so God keeps his promises, and uh, that was what was supposed to be taken away from that passage. 
Uh, at this point, we need to jump over to something that happened shortly before the city falls to the Babylonians. So I'm guessing that this next event happens somewhere in the very late spring, early summer of 587 B.C. So go to Jeremiah chapter 39, verse number 15. And this brings up an individual who acted as a hero earlier on behalf of Jeremiah. The word of he who is came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard. Because he's confined there right up until the Babylonians rescue him. Go, say to Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian. Now, Ebed-Melech, his name means servant of the king. He was from Ethiopia, which is associated with the, uh, the Egyptians. The Egyptians are right now enemies of the Babylonians, and uh, the Egyptians have recently lost ground in the area. They can't uh, rescue Jerusalem. And so Ebed Melech, who might have been a representative of the Ethiopian government to the Judean government, he's trapped behind enemy lines now, behind the Babylonian lines. And uh, he rescued the prophet Jeremiah from that muddy, empty cistern, showed him mercy and kindness. And so God is now going to show mercy and kindness to him. So go and say to ebed melech the Ethiopian, Thus says he who is of the armies, the God of Israel, Behold, I will fulfill my words against this city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. So the first thing in the message is, ebed melech get ready. You're going to see this city taken down because that's my promise. I am bringing my judgment on this city. But, verse 17, I will deliver you on that day, declares he who is, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. So he's afraid of being arrested by the Babylonian forces and treated like the representative of an enemy state. And God says, you don't need to worry about that. Verse 18, for I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war, because you have put your trust in me, declares he who is. So because of his faith in the one and true living God, he is going to be one of those that survive this siege and the fall of the city of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 52, and we're going to pick up in verse number 5. Jeremiah 52, verse number 5. Uh, and there's parallels in 2 Kings uh, 25, Jeremiah 39, but we're going to use the 52 of Jeremiah passage. Verse number 5. And uh, this is a continuation of the accounting of the siege of Jerusalem, which started on the 10th day of the 10th month in the ninth year of, uh, the, uh, uh, of the kingdom of Zedekiah. And this is what it says in verse number five. So the city was besieged till the 11th year of King Zedekiah. So for several years, the city has been under siege. And then verse number six, on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. So all the main food supplies were gone by the ninth day of the fourth month. Now that translates in our calendar uh, to uh, the end of June in 587. So all of the food is gone it's nothing but scraps left now. And so what are people going to be doing? They're going to be digging through even manure piles in order to find even the smallest bit that might provide some nutrition. They'll even be chewing on old leather. 
uh, verse number 7. Then a breach was made in the city. So the pounding of the, uh, of the ram against the wall finally breaks it, finally breaks a hole in it. And then all the men of war fled and went out of the city by night by the way of a gate between the two walls by the king's garden while the Chaldeans were around the city. So as soon as the wall is breached at one point, the security forces around King Zedekiah, they've got an escape plan. They've got a gate that they can sneak out of that apparently goes down into some low-lying land, down into a little gully where they think they're going to be able to sneak out in the middle of the night. Now, you might remember Ezekiel was supposed to show this happening by one of his little pantomimes where he digs a little hole through the wall, crawls through it with his stuff, and then he tries to walk away. Uh, But at that time, Ezekiel predicted Zedekiah was going to get caught. Now, it says here in the text, they went in the direction of the Arabah. The Arabah is the Jordan Valley, the Dead Sea Valley. Uh, that is immediately east of Judah and of Jerusalem. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. So exactly as predicted, Zedekiah tries to escape when the city is breached, He gets as far as the plains of Jericho when he is captured and all his security force evaporates. They disappear.